Okay, today I want to um, work on another skill that you can use in order to invent arguments, and that's called immediate inferences. An immediate inference is still a deductive inference, a deductive argument, but there's no mediation. That's why it's called immediate, as opposed to the syllogism, which is mediated. The way you make the inference based on uh, in a syllogism is the subject and predicate term are mediated. They're, they're moved from being premises to generate the conclusion. The way you would use this is once you've developed a conclusion, you can take that conclusion and use the traditional square of opposition that we'll cover today, or conversion, obversion, and contraposition. Or contra, you, you don't have to use them all. Conversion, obversion, or contraposition. These are all the forms of immediate inferences. So that's based on 5.5, 5.6. So we'll go back to chapter five. I deliberately left that out in the first part of this course because I realized that that's a form of inventing arguments. You're not really judging someone's argument with the square of opposition and with these further immediate inferences. So the way you would use that is if you're presenting an argument and you have a conclusion, what you can do is somewhere else in your thinking or somewhere else in your speech, you can take that conclusion and generate an immediate inference and use that to support your thesis. An immediate inference has the same logical equivalence as the original proposition that you're transforming. So I think it's best that we don't use any examples at the beginning. Remember I told you when you're manipulating logical arguments, it's best to work in the most formal symbolic way. But then later on, you wanna be able to instantiate and put content into that. But let's just work abstractly and get, it, get the, uh, the rules down. So this is called the traditional square of opposition. And so what you, what you wanna do in your mind, just create a square, okay? And in the top, um, here's your, I made like, usually I use a, so that's called the square of opposition. And in the top left-hand corner, put A there. So A means all S is P, right? It doesn't matter if it's an S, a P or an M, just all something is something. But let's just call it all S is P for now. And then, so that's a universal affirmative proposition. You know that by now. That's called an A proposition from the word affirmo, which means I affirm. And then there's the E proposition on the top right-hand part of the, the square. No S is P, or no M is S, or no P is S. But let's just call it no S is P for now. It's an E proposition, okay? And that's universal and it's negative. And then um, the bottom left-hand corner down here, that, that's an I proposition. That says some S is P or some M is S or some P is M. It doesn't matter if it's S, P or M, but some blank is blank. Let's just call it some S is P for now. So that's a particular affirmative, and then the O proposition is some S is not P, okay? So memorize this in the, in the uh, way that I'm presenting it to you. I've learned from practicing music and from practicing things all my life. When you, when you learn something, it's good to do it in the same order at the beginning. Then you wanna jumble it up and be able to just do it in any order but it's easier to remember things when, when, you re, when you're first learning something, learn it in the same order, okay? And I found this to be the best for me, and I think it would work for you. I find my role here is simplification. I want you to read 5.5 and 5.6 and do some exercises, but I'm going to simplify it way down for you. I'm gonna boil it down to its essence. And I found that to be another little trick in learning throughout my, 13 years of college and 
over 40 some years of teaching. Um, if, you can, if you can simplify things and hang on to the, the essence of that, then the details will fall in place. So let me help you simplify. So make your square, put A, E, I, and O down in that order, and then make an X right from, from the A to the O and from the E to the I. Just put a square, a, a, an X right in the middle of the square. Now that X is going to represent contradiction, okay? These words take on very specific meaning in logic. Like we use the word contradictions all the time in common parlance. And like I was telling you, the different disciplines use the same word in different ways. So logic gives absolute precision to that word contradiction. What a contradiction is, is that if something is true, the contradictory of that has to be false, okay? Or if something is false, the contradictory of that has to be true. So here's, what, here's how I memorize that. This is not rocket science, but you do have to remember what I'm saying now and, and keep it in your mind. Otherwise, you, you, um, you'll make mistakes. I mean, you can always look things up in the book, but when you're thinking, you don't have time to look these kinds of things up. Like, um, the more you can put into your memory and immediate recognition, not just in your memory, but immediate recognition. That means as soon as you think about it, you got it. Like, then you, that frees your mind to be creative because otherwise you're thinking, well, let's see now, what is a contradiction? And, and you can't come up with a contradiction. So that's the value of memorization. Okay, so here's, how, here's what you need to remember. I'll, I'll make like a catechism for you, you know, like a good Catholic. Just remember, contradictories cannot both be true, nor can they both be false. Just memorize that. Contradictions cannot both be true, nor can they both be false. So once you have that in your mind, memorized, then you know, if you have an A proposition, the contradictory of that, which is an O proposition, if you have all S is P, then the contradictory, that X goes over to the O. It says some S is not P. If A is true, then O has to be false. But you have to keep the subject and predicate terms the same. You can't change that. that, that that's not playing the game. So if you say all things that do not destroy you make you stronger, then, and you know that that's true, then some things that do not destroy you, do not make you stronger, has to be false. So if A is true, O has to be false. Let's say A is false, then O has to be true. Let, let's keep the content out of it now because that gets you thinking about the content and not the logical structure. So that's another little trick. When you're first learning logic, try to symbolize it as much as you can. Just work with form. Then later you can instantiate with content. So just have to remember, contradictories cannot both be true, nor can they both be false. So if A is true, if all S is P is true, then some S is not P has to be false. But let's say, all S is P is false. In your talk, you want to say, you know, um, all that glitters is not gold. You know, and all that glitters is gold. And you want to say that that's false. You could, okay, uh, well, let's keep away from the examples. That, so if A is false, then O has to be true. But you have to keep the subject and predicate terms the same. All right, let's just leave it at abstract. So all S is P is true, some S is not P is false. All S is P is false, some S is not P is true. And it goes the other way too, it goes both ways. That's why the arrow's going both ways. If O is true, then A has to be false. If O is false, then A is true. You just have to remember, contradictories cannot both be true, nor can they both be false. And the same thing works between the E and the I proposition. If, if no S is P is true, then some S is P has to be false. If no S is P is false, then some S is P has to be true. And it goes the other way too. If some S is P is true, then no S is P has to be false. If some S is P is false, then no S is P has to be true. 
So how can you use that to make an immediate inference? Let's say you make your conclusion is an A proposition. Well, somewhere in your speech, and you want to say that that proposition is false. Well, then somewhere in your speech, you can just say, some S is not P is true. Or you could even imply it in a rhetorical question. Like, let's say you're arguing for, um, you know, you're against the privatization of the schools, that we need public schools. So then you may ask, uh, can, can everyone afford $7,000 a year to send their kids to school? That would be 14,000 if you just have two kids. And you, you could just ask that as a rhetorical question. So A would be false, then some S is not P would be true. All right, so those are contradictions. The main thing, the, the, the key to contradictions is they cannot both be true, nor can they both be false. So how do you use that? Well, if you generate an A proposition and you wanna say it's true, you can just say somewhere in your speech, some S is not P, which is an O proposition, which is the contradictory, and you can, you can it's already false. And you can use that to support your claim, or you can use it to perhaps uh, re reduce your adversaries to a, an absurdity to, as an argument against the arguments against your position. We need to talk about that too, because when you present an argument, you want to anticipate the strongest arguments against your position. And you want to, you want to lay some arguments, you need to defend yourself against those positions. Otherwise, someone will just come and, and uh, so you always, that's why the, in, in forensic debate, they want you to know both sides of the argument. Not because you, you, they want you just to be on the fence, but they want you to be able to defend your position against the strongest opposition. We'll talk about that later. All right, so that's contradictions, okay? You can make an an A proposition, you can turn it into an O proposition. Keep the subject and predicate terms the same. And if an A is true, then you can make that O be false. If the A is false, you can make the O be true. And the same thing with the E and the I, or the I and the E, okay? I hope you understand that. Uh, maybe I'm going too fast, because sometimes I, I, when I'm learning new things and somebody really knows their stuff and then they go flying by, it really, upsets me because I think, well, you know how to do it. You're supposed to teach me. So let me, let me just go over one more time because I'm speaking quite fast. If you have an argument and your argument ends in, let's say an E, which is no S is P, you can take that E proposition and let's say you wanted to say that that E proposition is true. You take that E proposition and you can turn it into an I proposition because I is the contradiction of E. You know, the, the X, E, the contradictory of an E is I, contradictory of an I is E. And you keep the subject and predicate terms the same, exactly the same. Then you can generate an immediate inference. You can make an E proposition into an I proposition. You can make a true E proposition into a false I proposition, or you can take a false E proposition, turn it into a true O proposition. Did I say I before I meant O? The contradictory of E is I, the contradictory of A is O. I go like that. That's why, that's why I made you have that X. All right, so that, learn contradictions first. I belabored that too long. It's just contradictions cannot both be true, nor can they both be false. But I wanted to explain how you can use the square of opposition to generate immediate inferences. That's, it's a tool to generate immediate inferences. You don't have to support your, once you've, once you've um, established a conclusion, you can generate immediate inference and you don't even have to support it because you've already supported it with some syllogism or some other supports. It doesn't need a premise. It's, it's its own premise. You just take a proposition and you give a logical equivalent of that. You keep the subject and predicate terms the same 
or middle term, whatever those terms are, you keep them the same and you can generate an immediate inference. That makes, it, it gives, it, 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 it enables you to make your conclusion in other words, say it in a different way, but it has the same logical um, meaning. Okay. All right, the next, all right, so after you learn about contradictions, go to the top of the square. That's called contraries. So contradictions are different from contraries. Something can be contrary and not contradictory. So the A and the E are contraries. Now here's what you have to remember about contraries. They cannot both be true, but they might both be false. That's how I remember that. So what does that mean? That means if you know one is true, the other has to be false. If you know A is true, E has to be false. If you know E is true, A has to be false. But what, what happens if A is false? Then E is undetermined. We use that word, undetermined. Now that's not a bad thing to be able to generate something that's undetermined because your adversary might want to say that it's just how it is. You know, this is how it is. And you want to say, no, this is undetermined. So arguing that something is undetermined can be a good thing. In logic, there's only true, propositions can be true, false, or undetermined in deductive arguments. In inductive arguments, they can be highly or probable or less probable. So if you know, so these are contraries, and you have to remember, contraries cannot both be true, but they might both be false. So if you know one is false, if you know A is false, then E is undetermined. If you know E is false, A is undetermined. So you can take an A proposition that's false and turn it into an E proposition, keep the subject and predicates the same, but then that E proposition is undetermined. Okay, so the thing to remember about contraries, they cannot both be true, but they might both be false. The next thing to do is to go down to the bottom. So first contradictions, then contraries, and then go to subcontraries. Okay, so the relationship, the reason this is called the square of opposition is because it's different ways in which these A, E, I, and O propositions are opposed to one another. The word opposed is just meaning how they related to one another. There's a certain tension in between the two, how they relate to each other, how they're opposed to one another. And I'm outlining how they are. So subcontraries, what you need to remember about subcontraries, and that's the relationship between an I and an O. That's that opposition. It's just the inverse of contraries. Subcontraries cannot both be false, but they might both be true. So how can you use that? Well, if you, if you generate an argument that ends in an I proposition, and you want to say that it's false, then you can keep the same subject and predicate term, turn that I proposition into an O proposition and say that it's true because subcontraries cannot both be false. But if the I proposition is true, the O proposition is undetermined. It's just the inverse of contraries. Okay. So what you need to remember about subcontraries is they cannot both be false, but they might both be true. When we're all finished, I'll just give you like a catechism to memorize. And then once you memorize that, you'll have the whole square of opposition, at least theoretically. You have to know how to do it, but this, this is the part where I'm not sure if you're, you're clear. Like, let's say you want to generate a sub-contrary from an I proposition. So an I proposition is sum S is P. So what is a sub-contrary of an I? Sum S is not P. But subcontraries cannot both be false. So if that sum S is P is false, then sum S is not P has to be true. But subcontraries might both be true. So if sum S is P is true, then sum S is not P is undetermined. But theoretically, what to remember is they cannot both be false, but they might both be true. That's subcontraries. 
Now, the other relationship is between the A and the um, I and the E and the O. Those are called subalteration. That relationship is called subalteration. The one on the top is called the superaltern, and the one on the bottom is called the subaltern. Whenever you have an opposition, you have the poles and then you have the relationship. These are called the relata, and then there's the relationship. The relata are the two poles in between. So A is called the superaltern, and I is the subaltern. And that relationship is called subalteration. It goes both ways. And over here, the E proposition is called the superaltern, just like over here. And over here, it's called the subaltern. Sub means beneath, super means on top. So here's what you have to remember about subalteration. If the superaltern is true, then the subaltern is true. That is easy to understand. If all S is P is true, then some S is P is true, okay? If all people are mortal, then some people are mortal is true also. Or if you say no S is P, which is an E proposition, then and that's true, then O has to be true. So if the superaltern is true, the subaltern has to be true. But if the superaltern is false, the subaltern is undetermined. So if A is false, I is undetermined. If E is false, O is undetermined. Okay. Now that's going down from superaltern to subaltern. When you go up, from subaltern to superaltern, it's just the inverse. If the subaltern is false, the superaltern is false. If the subaltern is true, the superaltern is undetermined. So that's a little more complicated. Subalteration, here's what you have to remember about subalteration. If the superaltern is true, the subaltern is true. So A and E are the superalterns, and I is the subaltern of A, and O is the subaltern of E. So if the superaltern is true, the subaltern has to be true. If the superaltern is false, the subaltern has to be undetermined. And then that's going down. When you're going up from the subaltern to the superaltern, if the su subaltern is false, then the superaltern has to be false. But if the subaltern is true, the superaltern is undetermined, okay? So it's a very useful tool. Aristotle came up with this, again, what a genius. I mean, when you start thinking about who came up with this in the first place, it's amazing, right? So how can it be used? Like I told you, you can take a conclusion and generate immediate inference. You can take an E proposition and generate an, an A proposition out of it, make its contrary. And you can work with the truth or falsity of the propositions, okay? You can take an E proposition that's true, you can generate, use the same subject and predicate terms, make it into an I proposition. And though S is P is true, then somewhere else in your speech or in your thinking, you can say some S is P is true, is false, because you've already said no S is P is true. And contradictions cannot both be true, both be true. So here's your catechism. <laughs> I'm using the word, uh, religious words in a secular way. Um, I've heard it used that way before maybe. I have to check now. When you memorize a certain set of rules. Okay, so contradict. Okay, this, this is a square of opposition. You make your square, in the top left-hand corner you put an A, top right-hand corner you put an E, bottom left-hand corner you put your I, bottom right-hand corner you put your O. Then you make an X in between the square. That's going to be contradictions. And you just have to remember contradictory contradictions cannot both be true nor can they both be false. Then at the top relationship that's called contraries, just have to remember contraries cannot both be true, but they might both be false. Then go down to subcontraries. Subcon subcontraries cannot both be false, but they might both be true. 
then work with your subalteration on either side. If the superaltern is true, the subaltern is true. If the superaltern is false, subaltern is undetermined. Going up is just the inverse. If the subaltern is false, the superaltern is false. If the subaltern is true, the superaltern is undetermined. So it's a very useful tool for making immediate inferences, and you can use it to generate immediate inferences. You can say your conclusion in a logically equivalent way using the same subject and predicate terms, or maybe just synonyms. You know, when, remember, when you're giving your speech, you want to take the logical skeleton and enflesh it and, uh, you, and make it flow, give it a living body where the parts are fit together nicely. This, this takes time. It's not going to happen in one course like this, or, but you're young. And if you start now and you start studying classical rhetoric and start listening to people who speak eloquently, and, and you start noticing how, you know, this calling people names and hate speeches and dealing with, it'll be interesting, the debates are tonight in Cleveland and between Trump and Biden, you can watch the debate and see, you know, who's presenting arguments, who's using fallacies. And, and then the more you, the more you observe people, um, I mean, there are great speakers too. You can listen to speeches, you can, one person told me a long time ago, and helped me, he said, when you read, read with four eyes. He was using that as a metaphor. And with two eyes, read what's being said. With the other two eyes, pretend like you're, you know, you're doing two things at once. You're reading how it's being said. And you can emulate good style. In other ways, studying the history of classical rhetoric. All right, so that's the square of opposition. Now, there are three more immediate inferences that you can use. One is called conversion, one is called obversion, and one is called contraposition. And let me simplify that for you because that can be complicated. In addition to the square of opposition, there are these three other immediate inferences. So if you have an E or an I proposition, now your book says you can do, you can do this with O and uh, you can do you can do it with a, an if you have a e or an i your book says you can do it with an a by limitation but i'm going to simplify things because if you do it by limitation as the book says it's going to get you in trouble when you use it so just i'm not contradicting the book i'm just on page 169 copy summarizes obversion conversion obversion contraposition and he says that you can use you can convert using an I proposition by limitation. I just want to eliminate that because that makes problems down the road. So you just have to remember with conversion, you can only convert an E and an I proposition. Wait, wait, uh, wait. Um, not I, E and I. All S is P. You can't use it for an O. And you, and you can't use it for an A. Yes, I was right. You can only use it, just use conversion for E and I propositions. Okay. So if you have an E proposition, no S is P. If you, you can take that and switch the P and S around, you can say no P is S. And that's logically equivalent. So with conversion, obversion and contraposition, and I just talked about conversion now, we'll, we'll go over that one more time. The truth value remains the same. See with the square of opposition, the truth value sometimes changes. Like if E is true, and then you, you turn it into an I proposition, you make a contradiction. And then the truth value turns into its opposite, turns in the opposite. If E is true, then I becomes false. So with the square of opposition, it varies. Sometimes the truth value remains the same. Like if A is true, then I is true by subalteration. 
So with the square of opposition, you have to remember it the way I, I just presented it. But with conversion, obversion, and contraposition, the truth value remain the same. So if you start with false, the, the converse is going to be false. If you start with true, the converse will be true. And the same thing with aversion and contraposition. The truth value remains the same. So when you convert a proposition, the converted proposition has the same truth value. Or when you obvert a proposition, the aversion of that proposition has the same truth value. So if it's true, it's going to be true. If it's false, it's false. So with conversion, you just have to just remember, um, use it only for E and I propositions. So if you had some S is P, then you can say some P is S, because that's an I proposition. So with conversion, you just switch around the S and P's. Or if it's M and P, you put the P over here and the M over there. You, you just switch them around. You can do that. So just remember, to simplify it, um, no S is P turns into no P is S. That's the converse of that. Or some S is P turns into some P is S. So that's an easy one. You just switch around the subject and predicate positions. Okay. But remember to use it only for an E and I proposition. Kopi says you can use it for an A proposition by limitation, and then, and then it complicates things. And then it doesn't work with the syllogism later on, and, and so I don't want you to get involved in that. So to simplify things, I thought it through. I just was going to tell my class, tell you, that uh, just use it for E and I proposition. Okay. The next one is called obversion. And obversion you can use for all four types of propositions, A, E, I, and O. And what do you do? You change the quality into its opposite. Remember, there's only two qualities, affirmative and negative. And then you take the word non, not not. There's a big difference between not and non. The word non in logic, N-O-N, that's called the complement. Like I told you, look how different that is from common parlance, right? In ordinary language, when we say, oh, that, that, thanks for the compliment. Well, that's not what it means in logic. In logic, it means the word non, N-O-N. Not is something else. So how do, you, how do you make an obversion? You can do it with an A, an E, an I, or an O. It works for all four. You, you change the quality to its opposite, okay? So if it's affirmative, you make it negative. Okay, like if it's uh, A, you make it E. If it's negative, you make it affirmative. There's only two qualities, affirmative and negative. So remember, A is affirmative, E is negative. I is affirmative, O is negative. There's only two qualities. A and E, or A and I are affirmative. E and I are uh, E and O are negative. It's just that E is universal and O is particular. A is universal, I is particular, but that's the quantity. The quality is only two. There's only two qualities: affirmative and negative. And there's two quantities: there's universal and particular. So. Here's the rule. You just change the quality to its opposite and put the word non on front of the predicate term. Okay? Change the quality into its opposite. So like, let's say some S is P. What would it mean to change the quality into its opposite? Well, I need to take that I proposition, some S is P, and turn it into something negative. Okay, I keep the quantity the same. I don't change the quantity, I change the quality. So some S is P turns into some S is not P when I make my obversion because I've changed the quality into its opposite. Then you take the word non and put it on front of the predicate term. But you gotta keep that word not in there still too because so some S is P turns into some 
uh, yeah, some s is p turns into some s is not non p. So what did I do when I did that? I changed an i proposition into an o proposition because that changes the quality. i is affirmative, o is negative. I kept the quantity the same, they're both particular. And then I took the word non and I put it on front of the predicate term. It's gotta go in between, it's not non p. So some s is p turns into some s is not non p. Let's do an a proposition, all s is p. How do I change the quality of that? It turns into an E proposition. If I keep the quantity the same and I change the quality, A turns into E. So all S is P turns into no S is P. But then I have to put the word non on front of the predicate term. So all S is P turns into all S is non P. Let's do one more. Let's do an E proposition. What would, how do you make a obversion of an E proposition? What is an E proposition? Well, no S is P. I got to change the quality now. Well, in this case, I got to go from negative to affirmative. So if I change the quality of an E proposition into its opposite, it turns into an A proposition. No S is P turns into all S is P. But then I have to put the word non in front of the predicate term. So no S is P turns into all S is non P. So this is useful also. You can do this with all four different, if you have a, a conclusion, be it an A, E, an I, or an O, you can make an aversion of that. And you don't have to prove it. It's already been proven if you've already made it. If you have a syllogism and the conclusion is an A proposition, then you can turn it into you can make an obversion. You can take all S is P, turning it into no S is non P. And you can say it in plain English and don't speak like a cyborg, you know, or an automaton. You don't speak like that, but it has that same logical skeleton. You don't have to prove that. It's already been proven. It's been supported by your other, you've made an immediate inference, okay? And there's one more, it's called contraposition. And contrapositions, I, I want you to only use them for A and O propositions. Okay. Just use them for A and O propositions. So contraposition. Contraposition is this. You just do two things. You change the subject and predicate terms around and put the word non in front of both sides. And you have your contrapositive. Okay, so use it if you have all S's P, change the S's and P's around, like you do with conversion. So all S's P turns into all P is S, and then put the word non in front of both terms. So all S is P turns into all non P is non S. And of course, when you're thinking and when you're speaking or thinking in words, these are gonna be S's and P's are gonna be terms. They're gonna be categories. They're gonna be classes of things. And there's gonna be content there. We're just dealing now with the form of reasoning. So that's contraposition. So the three things with conversion, just use it for E and I propositions and, and switch the subject and predicate terms around. With obversion, change the quality into its opposite, put the word non in front of the predicate term. And it can be used for A, E, I, and O. And with contraposition, I want you to use it only with an A and O propositions now. And what you do is switch the subject and predicate terms around, invert them, and put the word non on from both sides. The truth value remains the same. So that's how you can use the square of opposition and conversion, obversion, and contraposition to generate immediate inferences. I think it would work best, you can do it with premises also, but to keep things simple now, I think it would be more persuasive 
in a speech if you would use them for generating a logical equivalence of your conclusions so that you could say your conclusion in another way and in, a in another way using a different type of proposition which is logically equivalent using the same subject and predicate terms, it would be more persuasive than if you did it with premises. So let's, let's restrict it to conclusions now. You can take your conclusion of a syllogism and invert, or you can, you, you can make a contradiction, a contrary, subcontrary, contrapositive, and so on, and you can generate immediate inferences and use that. The other way you could use uh, to generate an immediate inference, okay, to support your thesis. Your thesis is the general thing you're trying to, it's like your ultimate conclusion. And then all your arguments are supporting your thesis. A long time ago, somebody told me, it stuck with me, when you speak or when I write something, I try to make my thesis into one sentence, I try to just say one thing. Otherwise, people get all confused. You just ramble on. It's okay if you ramble and go on dig digressions, and as long as all that is just supporting one thesis. Because if you try to say too many things, people get confused. They don't know, when you're finished talking, they don't know what you've just said. They just know that you talked a lot and you said a few things. And, but if you have one thesis that you can support and put it in one sentence, you don't even have to say it in your talk, but make sure that all your arguments are supporting that thesis. When you're finished, you've emblazoned that in the minds and hearts of your listeners and your audience. And they leave the talk with that impressed on them. And they're not gonna forget what you just said. So that, that helps actually, just say one thing. But then you make a bunch of arguments and sometimes you wanna put your strongest argument uh, last. Your second strongest argument should be first because you don't want to start off too weak, otherwise you lose your audience. But you want your punch, the strongest one to be last. So, they, so make some arguments, put the second, the strongest one first, then put some arguments in there and then your strongest one, put it last. And take this logical skeleton and enflesh it, put it, make it into a living being that, where the parts fit together with transitions and animated by a single, just like a living being is animated by one soul, then animate your talk with one thesis, okay? The other thing, uh, since I'm talking about this, in classical rhetoric, they usually speak of three means of persuading people. There's ethos, pathos, and logos. These are three Greek words. Ethos, Aristotle thought was the most important. That's how you're being perceived by the audience. Is this a person of integrity? Does he or she practice what they preach? Are they virtuous? Do they possess the moral virtues? Do they have excellence of character? And that's the most important thing, Aristotle thought. I'm not sure how important that is today. It is important, it seems like, but the other two, pathos has to do with your pathos means passion, okay, feeling. So your the the uh, emotion, the emotional element of your talk should correspond to the topic. If you're talking about something like civil rights or something, then it's okay that your your voice, your your emotions become impassioned. But you got to be careful. You don't want to go overboard with that too. You just look like a raving maniac, you know, and then that turns people off. So make sure that your pathos matches the subject matter. And the one we're working on here is logos. Logos is the argument, the, argu the logic. That's where we get our word logic. Logos are the arguments, the, the logical skeleton that we've been working on. So Ethos is how you're being perceived by the audience. Pathos is having the right feelings with respect to your subject matter. And logos are the arguments that you're presenting. So these are three means of 
persuasion. That comes from classical rhetoric. And, and Aristotle, like I said, thought ethos was the most important. Some people, are, so you need all three because people um, are not just intellects. Sometimes you can convince somebody's intellect, but you haven't convinced their will. So you need to appeal to their emotions and you need to come across as a someone with moral integrity. Okay, but that's far afield from the square of opposition. So this talk mostly was the square of opposition. I sort of drifted into classical rhetoric because what the reason the two are connected. Once you have this logical skeleton that I'm helping you to learn how to make, then you want to enflesh it into uh, eloquent language and become wisdom speaking. Sapienza che parla. All right, we have one more thing I want to go over before, uh, and then I will have said everything I need, and I'll just help you to make your final presentations.